I'm not sure if you saw this or not, but Eric Rosa recently posted on his Instagram about this bipartisan bill that was just introduced into the Senate, $30 billion of stimulus funds to go to gyms, not CrossFit gyms, but gyms in general. And something that CrossFit has been working with a couple of other players in the space, I know Zumba's involved, I know a couple other smaller, more like boutique, small group class style gyms are involved in this. And the idea is to essentially create a stimulus package for this industry that was hit incredibly hard by the COVID lockdowns this past year in 2020. And now it raises an interesting question, at least interesting to me, and I think you guys will agree, which is what exactly is CrossFit's job right now? What is Eric Rosa's job? How do you define that? What is it they're trying to do? And when you look at the 11 months that Eric Rosa has been in charge of CrossFit, much of what we've seen in terms of changes have to do with just general structural changes within the organization, as well as the CrossFit games being more sort of like hit the rewind button and take it back to something we're all way more familiar with in the 2017, 2018 style of regionals. And so we've seen many different things happen on the games side of things. We've seen a brand new 2020 CrossFit games happen with like a different format that was entirely meant to deal with the scenarios they found themselves dealing with, the environment they found themselves in with all the COVID lockdowns. We've seen a move away from Reebok to Noble. We've seen a brand new seasonal format come out that has a lot of, let's say, reminiscent portions to the structure of seasons past. These are all things that happen on the game side, but the game's are not and have never been CrossFit's core business. So what is CrossFit's job? Well, Eric Rosa has done a decent job of communicating. I mean, they have those quarterly town halls as difficult as they are to find and as, you know, loose as they are on details. At the very least, he he's telling people, this is what I'm interested in. I'm speaking to you, the affiliate owners, directly. I'm looking to do these things for you. We're going to help you out with back of the house management software, maybe some payment processing, maybe some sort of like online thing that your members can log into and get classes. And maybe we'll even be able to provide you guys with some sort of a class blueprint or structure or lesson plan to follow on a regular basis at your affiliate, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, Eric Rose's job, CrossFit's job, boils down to two things. Because when you look at their business, the part of the business that was the least utilized in terms of trying to make a buck were the affiliates. And so if you look at the training side of things, the education side of things, that is a business that gets a really solid push of income just by the rest of the business succeeding. If affiliates are doing well, people are gonna be interested to learn about what CrossFit is, and they're gonna send more people to the L1s. That's just generally, if people are having a good experience with this thing, then they're gonna send more people to the L1s. You don't really need to do a ton there, and that was making a lot of money for CrossFit as is. The affiliates were making a lot of money for CrossFit, but the relationship that Greg Glassman established with the affiliates he called it the least rents model. Hands off is a really easy way of looking at it. Essentially, Glassman didn't want anybody to tell him what to do, so he wasn't going to tell anybody else what to do. Rabid libertarian by his own words. This was both a very interesting and new take on things, but also wasn't exactly proven in the sense of a business. And so when you look at the affiliates, the affiliates probably left, I don't know, a billion plus dollars on the table in terms of revenue and value to the company. So what is Eric Rosa's job? How does he actually serve those things and bring CrossFit to a place where not just the industry itself is doing well, but the company, the organization that is CrossFit does well so that he and his investors can make their money back? My thought is two things. And when I opened this video, I told you about that Senate bill about stimulus funds to gyms. And I think that is a really good example, along with a couple other things that we've seen, 
that answers both the pieces that I'm about to bring up. The other thing that we're gonna reference here, not just that, that stimulus package bill, but those community gyms that we've seen pop up in a couple of different uh, cities around the United States. These community gyms are essentially small private CrossFit affiliates run by CrossFit, handpicked. They're free for, um, I believe it's like socioeconomic status, uh, particular socioeconomic status, inner city kids to come in, something to do, somewhere to learn about uh, nutrition, fitness, get a little bit of confidence, get a sweat going, uh, do something different that maybe puts them into a path where they can succeed and or even potentially get a job down the line, right? Makes a lot of sense, totally love it, big fan of that and the stimulus package both. But here are the two things that are driving this. Here are the two buckets that need to be filled by CrossFit and Eric Rosa for them to be doing their job. Bucket number one, they need to prove to the outside world that CrossFit as a brand is actually something that is positive, good, and valuable. And CrossFit has done a terrible job of doing that over the past year. Because if you look at the main stories that CrossFit has been known for over the past year or so, I mean, it's like Greg Glassman is the big one, although that has been dying down, which is you know probably good for CrossFit as an organization. Uh, this like wild connection to Marjorie Taylor Greene, like every single time she gets mentioned somewhere, anywhere online, it's always somehow CrossFit is also plugged in there. And even though CrossFit has done a pretty decent job of saying, hey, she's not a part of our, our environment anymore. She's not in our family anymore. Or maybe she was an affiliate owner at one time, but she's not one anymore now or whatever their language is it still gets brought up. And then there was also, I think it was in New Jersey, there was that gym owner in New Jersey who like racked up a bunch of fines for not following the mask or social distancing or, or sterilization mandates or whatever. And it also ended up getting broiled into some sort of like racist emails. I, I have no idea. I don't know. All I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about the stories that CrossFit has been attached to over the past 12 months or so are not positive stories. And when you look at this stimulus package thing and you look at these inner city community gym things, those are actually actively trying to change that narrative to prove to outsiders, because that's really the thing, right? If you're already inside the community, you don't really have to have its value proven to you. But to prove to outsiders that CrossFit is a positive force in the world, that it's doing something valuable, interesting, and worth being associated with. So that's one thing that CrossFit needs to be doing. And these two examples show that they're actively working towards. The second thing is more internal. CrossFit and Eric Rosa need to prove to the affiliates that it financially makes sense for them to be continued to be affiliated with CrossFit, both in a branding sense, as well as in an actual legal contractual sense of paying CrossFit to use the name. And that actually deep dips into something a little bit deeper. And here's what I'm talking about. If you look at the relationship that CrossFit had with its affiliates under Greg Glassman, it was very bare bones. You pay your several thousand dollars a year, you get to use the name. It's valuable in that you are associated with this global brand and you don't really have to provide much in return other than a few thousand dollars, which in terms of starting a business like this is a pittance. It really is not a lot of money compared to other types of businesses where you're going to be paying some sort of either a licensor or a franchisor in order to be a part of that. And so when you look at the types of things that Eric Rosa has been bringing to the table in terms of Here's what we would like to do for you. The back of the house management software for your clients, your scheduling software, your uh, floor plan lesson plans for your daily classes, uh, access to online classes for your members. All this stuff is value added stuff. It's not like it's just gonna be provided for free. There's gonna be probably some sort of cost involved in those things, but it's there to entice that financial relationship even further. So what role does the community gym play in actually helping solidify the value of that financial relationship? Well, if the community gym is essentially CrossFit's way of saying, hey, listen, we're gonna help this group of people, we're gonna help this world, this environment in this way with these people, 
Well, they have to be able to actually run a real gym in order to do that. The physical space within which they are doing that needs to function as some sort of a proof of concept that the things that CrossFit is able to provide to the affiliates are proven to actually work. At the very least, they have to be able to say, hey, you know what? We also run an affiliate. We also have to staff a 5 a.m. class. We also have to deal with the X, Y, and Z headaches that come with actually staffing and running a facility. And those types of experiences are really important to the affiliate owners who are already within the ecosystem to be able to say, hey, you know what? I see what you're doing. I see that you can actually not just clinically understand what it is that I go through on a day-to-day basis opening my doors, but also you can just really empathize with me because you have gone through the exact same thing and you are continuing to do so in a proven footprint somewhere in the physical world. And that is really interesting because if you can actually say that CrossFit successfully does its job proving the brand to the outside world that it's valuable, positive, and worth being associated with, and then financially proving to the affiliates that they are benefiting greatly from being in a financial relationship with CrossFit, the end result of that is net positive for pretty much everybody involved, but it also paints a picture for what CrossFit wants to do down the line because the community gym isn't just the community gym. It's not just the community center. It's acting as, and if it isn't, they really should consider doing this, it's acting as a sort of beta for all the little things that they think are going to improve an affiliate's model. And as an affiliate owner himself, Eric Rosa understands what goes into an affiliate's model. So building out, hey, you know what, if we could do it from the ground up, this is how we would do it, not just proves that you can do the thing to begin with and that your systems work, but it also acts as a sales point for your future customers, for affiliates who are like, hey, you know what? Maybe we should use that client management software. Maybe we should use your lesson plans for our workouts. Maybe we should use your payment processing system. I don't even know if they have a payment processing system, but you understand what I'm saying. The community gym acts as a footprint, as a prototype, as a beta test, for CrossFit's trying to prove that, hey, it's valuable to be associated with us and it's valuable to be in business with us. And those two things are incredibly important and necessary for CrossFit's continued success. In my estimation, that is CrossFit's job at this point to actually actively prove those two things.